This AIB original programming is being presented thanks to the generous supporters of viewers like you. Movies have the ability to entertain, to empower, to inform, and to comfort. On this episode of Art Comes Alive, we're going to Out on Film, Atlanta's premier LGBTQ film festival, to take a look at the movies giving a voice to a community often silenced. Out on Film started in 1987, and a small kind of weekend, you know, with a few films, and it grew through the years um, and became part of the Atlanta Film Festival, Image, Film, and Video at the time. And they produced it for a long time, um, all through the 90s and into the 2000s. And in 2008, they spun off um, and created Out on Film as an independent organization. Uh, my husband Jim and I came on board that year and started producing the festival in 2009. And we celebrated our 30th anniversary last year. So this year will be our 31st anniversary uh, out on film. I think that, um, you know, film, you know, speaks to so many people. I mean, uh, you, you can, you know, TV is important too, but film, I don't know, I mean, I guess maybe we all grew up watching TV at home. It was there. Film is more of an event. You know, when you go see a film, you know, generally you have to go somewhere. And, you know, for me, it's always been an event, an escape. And it's really great when you can uh, see a movie that just, you know, transforms you to another place, introduces you to another voice you didn't see. Or most importantly, you know, it's something you can relate to. You can see yourself on, on, on screen. You know, I grew up in a small town in Middleville, Georgia. And uh, there was a movie theater near my grandmother's. So whenever I'd visit her, I'd always sneak off to the movies. You know, it became more frequent, two or three times a week, and I just fell in love with the movies. It was just an escape for me, a way of discovering new worlds, new people. And then, you know, as I, as I, when I moved to Athens and started seeing a, a more variety of movies, I realized that, you know, I, I saw myself in a lot of these LGBT stories that I was now seeing. And it was a great escape for me, and I just always had that passion. We produce this festival so that we can provide a safe space for the community to come together and experience our stories and our lives on the screen. I think being together as a community and experiencing a story together on a big screen is really significant and it provides an emotional bond. Um, we're all there together and experiencing this story you know, at the same time, and we all have different responses. And I think for the community to experience that together is really important, not just for the sake of identity, but just to see yourself um, with other people. I view things on various devices when we're screening for, for the program, and I very specifically sometimes wait and wanna see things with the audience on a big screen, and it is a completely different experience. And I think that's why it's important. And I think culturally for the city and for the LGBTQ community, I think it's just a vital connection to our emotional lives and our stories. A lot of our patrons live in Midtown, but a lot of our other patrons live in places across the state or other places in the Southeast. And they don't have places where they can go where there are other LGBT people. Or they can't even be out at work. So when they come to an event like this, you know, for the first time, they're surrounded by their community and they can watch movies and see themselves on, on screen. And they, uh, they appreciate that and they always acknowledge it and they always are very gracious about telling us afterwards that for the first time I feel comfortable being here and I see someone like myself on screen. I think when we started in the 80s, it was a lot really about coming out. Um, it was a lot about the AIDS crisis and telling the stories of people, you know, in the epidemic. And then we have evolved in just storytelling and in film over the years to, we still talk about coming out. We, you know, we have retrospective now of the AIDS crisis. And we also have films about what it's just like living with AIDS as a person. Um, but we've evolved more into just storytelling about how we live how we live our lives, how we love, how we have relationships, how we have family. Uh, and so just in terms of content, 
it has really evolved in subject matter. I would say every year we think we're never going to top this year in terms of the number of films and in terms of the, 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 the variety of content and just the quality. We're always like, well, this is it. <laughs> we're never going to meet this one again. Um, but every year the filmmaking community really comes through. Um, I will say this year we have a number of films that are real standouts. Um, we are opening with a film called When the Beat Drops, and it's about an Atlanta um, dance competition. Um, and, and the documentary follows a group of men who are involved in what is called bucking, which comes out of historically black colleges and university drill teams. Um, and they weren't allowed to participate because they were men and they were gay men. So they formed it on them, for, formed it themselves. And they have a dance troupe, they have competitions. And the director, Jamal Sims, does a really beautiful job of bringing these men's stories to, li to life. And the second one is called Canary, which is set in 1985 in South Africa about um, gay men conscripted to the army for their compulsory service. And they are put into the chorus, which is called the Canaries. And it just follows how their relationships evolve under a criminal penalty system where homosexuality is still, was still illegal in 1985 there. And then we also have one called A Moment in the Reeds, which is looking at the Syrian refugee crisis in Scandinavia uh, with a Syrian refugee and a Finnish man who go to the countryside and fall in love. So it, it really is the, the, just the variety of different themes and films that we're able to show is just really pretty exciting. Man Made is again one of my favorites of this year. Um, T. Cooper's film, it's a documentary set here in Atlanta as well. And he really, um, he sort of explores, you know, transgender individuals who are getting ready for um, the bodybuilding competition here. And it really just looks at, you know, their lives, their professional lives, their personal lives, how they get ready, and the struggles they're dealing with as they get ready for the competition. Man Made is a feature documentary which follows four transgender men uh, as they prepare to meet and compete at the only all transgender bodybuilding competition in the world, which actually happens to take place in Atlanta. When I came to Atlanta, I moved here about four years ago, and I heard from someone who heard from someone that there was a transgender bodybuilding competition, and I was pretty fascinated by the notion of bodybuilding, as especially for the trans community, uh, especially for trans men. And I did a little investigating, and I'm, I'm a writer. Uh, I write mostly fiction, but also a lot of journalism. So my first impulse was to write a piece of nonfiction about it. And I did a little research and started looking at the imagery. And I thought uh, it would be a great piece for some of the magazines I write for. And I pitched the story to a few of the editors. And they were into it. But once I started talking to the guys, I realized their lives were like just so rich. And there was so much more than just that one moment stepping on stage. I'm a trans man myself, and um, I'm not a bodybuilder, obviously. They have very skinny arms. <laughs> um, and, but the, the, the bodybuilding as a metaphor, and um, as, as a metaphor for what we all do as far as building our lives, trans or not, I believe that we all build and construct our lives and our bodies from the minute we're born to the minute, you know, we leave this planet. Um, so, for trans men whose stories I don't feel like I see a lot of, um, I don't feel like I see my story out there as much. I was just really drawn to that kind of desire to attain whatever that pinnacle of masculinity is. And um, what was so unique about it and what drew me to this competition in particular is that there is not one version of masculinity that is represented on stage. So if you see the film, you'll see guys that, yeah, look kind of like mini Mr. Olympias. <laughs> you know, only mini because they haven't been doing it that long, but guys who, who are ginormous, with ginormous muscles. And then, you know, all the way down to somebody who, in the film, stepped on stage for the first time ever before being on testosterone, you know, before having a, a surgery of any kind. And it could have been a docu-series on its own, but um, I started filming with maybe six or seven folks, mostly four or five, and then, you know, depending on what happened in their lives. So, you know, one of them who was local actually uh, had an emergency 
that made it so he couldn't compete, so he kind of dropped out and then another one moved forward. So it was really about taking the year of their lives between competition and figuring out how to tell the story of, of not only their journey to the competition, but also just so many things in their lives that were happening that wasn't, had nothing to do with bodybuilding, had nothing to do with being transgender, from locating a biological parent and meeting for the first time to breakups and job stuff. One of our um, competitors became homeless, actually, between the first competition to the next competition. So there was just like a, a real kind of three-dimensional look at what a trans male journey looks like um, from a variety of, of perspectives. Some, you know, it, there's difference in age, race, class, geography, um, stage of transition, level of familial support, relationship status. They were just, these guys are just diverse in every way you can possibly imagine. There's not just like one trans male journey, but you know, it feels like a real cross section. I think of this film as storytelling from the inside looking out. So yes, there were some really uncomfortable moments, um, but I, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 they were so open and vulnerable and true, and I, I guess I think that's what made it such honest storytelling in the end, because, um, I, yeah, because I was there for these major landmark moments in, in these guys' lives. Some, some of those things were trans-related and some of those were not. Um, and I think that they trusted me to tell an honest, authentic story that was not sensationalized and was not, um, ooh, look at this weird subculture. Like, it's not a weird subculture. That's my culture. Those are my stories. I told four versions of my story um, in this film. We premiered here in Atlanta at the Atlanta Film Festival, and we won Best Documentary of the whole festival. So to me, to have a trans Trans-made, Atlanta-made, trans film, um, speak to that many people at a you know mainstream festival was just it was like okay, <laughs> you know I just feel so lucky that folks at the Out on Film, LGBT festival, <laughs> all the way to you know mainstream festivals can connect to these stories um, and that they felt like they were told in different ways for. In a unique enough way for trans people to feel connected, but also for, for folks from mainstream, more mainstream communities to, to get it. We've heard from T. Cooper about his documentary, Man Made. But when we come back, we'll take a look at another filmmaker documenting a powerful moment in the LGBTQ history. When Art Comes Alive returns. Cindy L. Abel is a filmmaker. Video and film is really the language that we communicate with the most frequently right now, and it's also very impactful. She's also the director and producer of Surviving the Silence, a documentary telling the amazing story of Colonel Patsy Thompson and her wife, Barbara Brass. We've shown a lot of Cindy's films in the past, and Cindy is a great collaborator. We've had great in experiences with Cindy with some of her films. So we're very, very happy that we can use that on film as a place to preview some of the clips from Surviving the Silence and to be able to have uh, the premiere of the film next year. Surviving the Silence, our film that is in post-production at the moment, is the incredible true story of two women in love who helped change the course of military history. And in the film, we delve into the really deep personal relationship between Colonel Pat Thompson and her now wife of 34 years, Barbara Brass. In 1992, Colonel Margareta Kammermeyer was on track to become one of the very first generals in the Army National Guard, and she was asked her sexual orientation, and she told the truth, that she was a lesbian. And so then the Army started proceedings to kick her out, and they appointed Colonel Pat Thompson, herself a closeted lesbian, to supervise and preside over the board. Now, Colonel Greta Kammermeyer's story, Barbara Streisand made a movie about her, Glenn Close played Colonel Greta Kammermeyer, it was on television, won some Emmys. But Colonel Pat Thompson's story is a closeted lesbian who had to do the unthinkable and the deeply painful. That was never known till a few years ago. She was in a lot of emotional and moral distress because she thought, how can I do this? First of all, 
this is one of my own. And also, this is just an exemplary nurse who had a bronze star from Vietnam and tons of awards and was very valuable to her unit. So she thought, well, I could come out and refuse to do this, but what good would that do? Then there'd be two of us who were being thrown out. And then she thought, well, I might be under investigation. And so I, maybe I'll just keep it low, do the bare minimum, and get through it as best possible. But instead, she chose to do something that had never been done before, allowed in all this testimony that was then used in court for Colonel Greta Kammermeyer to be reinstated. And so she found a way to follow the rules while at the same time providing a way for her colleague to eventually be reinstated and be one of four serving openly under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and definitely the highest ranking as a colonel herself. And Greta Kammermeyer credits Colonel Thompson with being one of the people who began the beginning of the end of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And so it's, to me, that's really fascinating. And it's one of those stories that no one knew until a few years ago. We talk about what they had to endure when Colonel Thompson, for example, was the first Army National Guard chief nurse and had to spend three years at the Pentagon and how they had to talk in code because they thought their phones were being tapped. Or when Colonel Thompson spent six months in the jungle of Panama and Barbara could never get a hold of her. A lot of people don't think about the implications of being in the military and being gay and the pressure that that put on their partner who also had to be in the closet. And Barb is a very open person, was beginning to explore activism as she was coming out. And then in order to be with Pat, she had to set all that aside. And she talks about being angry and being angry about having to be closeted in their own home when people would come and visit. And what that meant to her and the personal pain and sacrifice that she went through, as well as Colonel Thompson talking about what it meant to live in one world at work and then try to carve out another space in her life for the person that she loved. You know, this was still in the early days of gay people coming out and hate crimes was a fairly frequent thing even back then. And so they had to protect themselves for Pat's career and also from the unknown in their neighborhood. And so that provided a lot of anxiety. Always having to be on guard, never knowing who might be looking over the fence from you know a two-story house somewhere nearby. Now, they've made up for that. In the last four years, they've become activists on a big scale. And at 81 years old, Pat finally told her family in North Carolina that she was a lesbian. Before that, she wasn't ready. And they're in every pride parade, and they're real involved in PFLAG, and anything and everything they can do, they'll show up. Because they know how important it is to tell their story and to remind folks that regardless of where people are in their coming out journey, to have hope and to have courage and to know that there will be a time when you can come out, look for those opportunities and find a safe way. But hold on, you can do this, it's gonna be okay. And until you can, we're out here, we're marching for you, we're speaking out and giving voice for the voiceless. And so to me, I felt very honored to be entrusted with that to be entrusted with some of their most difficult memories and you know as they would tear up or as they would choke up or they would need a moment and i was also very humbled by the the scope of the task if you will being really cognizant of the fact that we needed to get this right we needed to document history this is part of military history in the united states as well as part of lgbt history and so I wanted to make sure that we got it right and we did it in a way that really recognized and respected the experiences of the women who went through it. We love Cindy, but she's also just so passionate about what she does. And you know, we're passionate too, so we, we can, it's great when we see filmmakers who just love what they're doing and love being able to tell stories and share those stories with other people.
important. I think for film, I think the way that you can tell a story, the way that you can construct a story, when for instance you're seeing a documentary, the way that you can really get to know somebody by seeing the person and hearing the person in his or her or their own words, I think it's a very powerful medium. And, and you can really have an intense emotional connection. The ultimate goal for me is for people to take one step closer toward living their life authentically, whatever that means to them. And that transcends sexual orientation and gender expression and identity. That's about all of us. Because we know that when we have secrets, regardless of what those secrets are about, that we don't live a full life. We don't bring our full selves to our relationships and to our work environment and our communities. And so not only do we miss out, our world misses out on everything that we have to bring. So I hope when people walk out of the theater, or they've turned off their television or iPad, that they'll say, huh, here's an area in my life where I can take one step closer to being my full self and living authentically. We're just looking for quality. Um, you know, th these stories of interest that, that will really resonate with people. We look for themes, uh, we look for representation. It's really, really important to us that we are able to represent the entire LGBTQ community. And so we seek out films that represent everybody. So whether it's for an audience of 500 or of 12, we think it's important that everybody see themselves on screen. I also want to keep pushing and I want these stories and other stories like this, um, trans made stories, to find homes and to, to, you know, be as important. Like, you'll see, if you do see the film or if you see the film, you'll see that essentially it's an uplifting, hopeful story. And that's not to say that there aren't incredible challenges, but ultimately, these guys are being celebrated for who they are and how they live their lives. And I, and I feel like, unfortunately, because of some of that outside looking in storytelling about trans lives, a lot of that is, ends up feeling tragic and ends up feeling, well, I mean, people are being punished for being trans. They're being raped and murdered and, you know, I, I don't think trans lives have to be tragic for us as a culture to care about them and to have empathy. I understand the impulse because it's horrible that so many trans women of color, for instance, are murdered all the time. We probably hear about, you know, an eighth of them. Um, but I'm just saying we don't have, all the stories don't have to be about that in order for us to care and donate and have empathy and connect. I don't believe that um, we exclusively need to tell our own stories, but I do think that we need to have equal access to telling those stories, whether that's institutional support or you know, corporations who, who end up buying these, these projects to honor those stories at least as much um, as the ones who are being told more from the outside looking in. It's just so important. You know, insist on your story and don't, don't take no for an answer because no in one place, you know, it, it could be a yes, five more no's down the road. And, and I found that. And um, even as we try to move into selling the film, I, I'm, I'm trying to take that philosophy and that advice for myself. Um, being told, we already have a trans film, there's a million things wrong with that. <laughs> um, I might not be able to change that right now, but I'm gonna find my way around that because there isn't just one trans film, there isn't just one trans journey. And, and this film, literally in its construction and existence, counters that. There are several narratives. Um, so I'm trying to keep that for myself. And I think that's good advice for anybody is that you just gotta find your yes. Our audiences love new voices. They love finding new people, discovering them. So many times we've had filmmakers down here who are working on their first project or second project and then flash forward five years later and you know, one of our filmmakers was nominated for an Oscar three years ago. It's so nice to really you know, track their project, you know, track where they're going in their career and, and you know, what they've done and how this, events like this can really kind of spring forward, spring them forward. This year's festival is real special for us because, um, you know, we spend a lot of, you know, I think, I, I'm pretty obsessive as a festival director. I, I, I spend a lot of time planning the schedule, planning the program, trying to get that 
perfect balance between you know men's films, women's films, transgender films, comedy, drama, documentaries, short films. And we spend a lot of time making the program, and we're just very happy with it. We're very happy with the balance. Very happy that um, you know we have films at our at our own film that you can't see other places, and that's very important to us. I think what I would like for the filmmakers to take away from the festival is for them to have their moment. I mean, just to take that moment. Um, you know, sometimes this is their, somebody's first film, it might be their second, and, and what people have to go through to get these films made is just tremendous, trying to get the money and everything and the post-production. And so for the filmmakers, I really want them to have their moment. I, I've seen filmmakers over the years really have that emotional connection and that emotional moment with the audience. And it's really a beautiful thing to experience in that moment. And you can't stream that and you can't see it later <laughs> on, on YouTube. You have to be there for it. And I think it's very moving for the filmmakers. As a filmmaker, I see the value of film festivals being First of all, we get to show our films to larger audiences on bigger screens than we might otherwise be able to. We get to meet distributors. We get to meet fellow filmmakers who can help point us in the right direction for getting distribution for our films, which then increase the audience and more people get to benefit from the stories being told. They're also a place where we can come and learn from each other as filmmakers and see films we wouldn't normally get to see and say, wow, that's very interesting how that filmmaker used this technique. Or they really went deep and covered a lot of layers. How can I better do that in my own film? What do I want to bring out? And so as a filmmaker, there's a lot of value there. As an audience member, it's incredible. I get to be exposed to films that I would probably not normally even know about and I get exposed to stories of real people doing real things, whether they're narratives or they're documentaries. And I can look at my own life and say, how is my life like that? How, why is it that I relate so deeply to that character? And as their hearts are being touched, then their mind starts to change. I think for our audience, what I would really like for our audience to come away with is just that real sense of community, that I, I've seen myself, I, I, it's emotionally validating for people. You know, we laugh, we cry, we see ourselves sometimes in all our ugliness and sometimes in all of our humanity and love. And I think for me, I would really like for people to walk away feeling that they've seen themselves. Thanks for watching. Go to aibtv.com forward slash donate to support programming like this. All contributions are tax deductible.